Terrific. I would love it if you keep your Bibles open um, or your phone open at the Bible. If you're one of the children, you should have one of uh, the activity sheets. Hopefully you got that when you come in. You may want to turn to page two, all sorts of things for you to listen out for, to draw, uh, to think about uh, during the sermon. So make sure you've got those open. Let's pray uh, for God to help us to concentrate and to be amazed by the person of Jesus. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for what you teach us in the Bible, and we do pray that you would show us great things today about Jesus Christ. Amen. Earlier this week, I came across a new type of clock. I don't know if you like clocks. Here's the one I found. It's called the death clock. Does that sound fun? The death clock is basically a website that calculates the date of your death. I know it's a happy thought on a Sunday morning. Bet you're glad you came to church. Uh, in case you're interested, maybe you want to search this later. Uh, what you do is you find the website, you enter a few of your life details, what you like to do, uh, click a button, and then before your eyes, you see how long you've got left. Now, I think it's fair to say that most of us don't like to face up to the future. We know the numbers. Uh, we know that 100% of people who are born will die. That's everybody who's born will die. However, even though death is a certainty, we often like to ignore it. And there's two big reasons for that. Uh, first big reason, of course, and we know this all too well, we get distracted, overwhelmed by just the busyness of life, don't we? Just every day, we say, where did the time go? Where did the hours go? Just another day just consumes us. The busyness of the moment means that so often we don't think ahead to what we know is coming. It's the first big reason. Second big reason is that many people don't really have a clear answer for what happens next. And when we don't know something for sure, well, we know what happens in life, we often stay quiet. Now, obviously, sometimes we are shocked by an event and we get to think about it for a moment. That's what coronavirus did uh, at the early days of coronavirus. Loads of people around the world uh, thought about their mortality and the fact that they were going to die. And yet, what do we know so well? It doesn't take very long, does it, after the initial shock uh, to go back to the way things were. And we return to our previous way of denial and distraction. Well, this morning, I'm not trying to depress you, but this morning, what I want to do, I want to show us from God's book, the Bible, an answer for death that is true, that is positive, that is credible and is highly motivational, not just for the future, but for every single day of our life. And what is that answer? Got your Bibles open. Um, have a listen to verse 25. Uh, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Well, friends, the background to this story is that Jesus um, is on his way to see a friend of his who has died. It's the very sad news that a friend of Jesus, Lazarus, is dead. Uh, he was the brother of Mary and uh, the brother of Martha. And when he was very, very ill, not quite dead, but when he was very, very ill, uh, the sisters had sent word to Jesus to ask Jesus to come straight away to help him. They knew that Jesus has amazing power to heal people, so they thought, get Jesus, and Jesus will sort out the problem. But what we discovered in John chapter 11, and get this, Jesus deliberately decided to stay where he was, deliberately, delays, and by the time he arrives, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Now, let me ask you a question just as we move through. How do you deal with when God delays his intervention. We're not very good at delay at all, are we? But how good are we when God deliberately, because of his wisdom, and for better plans for us in the future, delays his intervention? Well, often when God delays, we experience pain as we wait. That's why we don't like it. But how good are we at trusting God that he knows better when he delays his intervention. Well, that's what he did here. Jesus delayed because there was something better to come. Not just the healing of Lazarus, but we're about to see 
our resurrection from the dead. Now, we're told, if you look in verse 21, what Martha said to Jesus when she saw him. Listen to this. Lord Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. You can feel the disappointment, can't you, in our words? If you had been here, my brother would still be breathing. The one person in the world who could have made a difference didn't. It's not hard, is it, to imagine the thoughts that would have been racing through her mind as she waited for Jesus to come. Surely he'll come. Surely when he hears that Lazarus is sick, he'll be here in a flash. He'll be on the fastest camel down the motorway or whatever. But he didn't come. Lazarus simply got worse, but the knock on the door never came, not to help, not to heal, not even to bury him. And now four days later, Jesus shows up. And so what can he do? You know, Lazarus is dead, and he's been dead for four days. So it's not even that Jesus arrives on the scene, maybe like Dr. Ollie would, you know, just after the heart has stopped breathing, and then you do some CPR, and he's, he's, he's all right. It's not that even Jesus has arrived just at that moment. Lazarus has been dead for four days. So what can Jesus Christ do when confronted with a dead body? Uh, in an interview broadcast uh, back in 2003, now, that's probably before some of you in this room were actually born. Uh, there was someone called Samantha Roberts. Samantha Roberts was the widow of the first British soldier killed in the Iraq War. And she told when she met President George W. Bush, he had made a state visit to the UK a month earlier, she had met the president and she recalled standing before, as she quotes, the most powerful man on earth, and she then added, but he couldn't bring back my husband. But what about Jesus? What can he do when confronted with one of the greatest enemies of the human race? Well, listen again to his wonderful words, verse 25. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die die. Now, friends, these words of Jesus are exactly what we need to hear and exactly what we need to believe in the face of tragedy. When you suffer the death of a loved one, or maybe when you are faced with your own mortality, your own death, when you've been diagnosed with maybe a life-threatening illness that has come out of nowhere, what is the one thing you need to hear? What do you need most? Someone to talk to? Yes, of course you need someone to talk to. The warmth of friendship? Of course you need the warmth of friendship. But above all, when we are sinking into the abyss of grief, we need more than just sentiment. Sentiment that, that things will be all right on the night. Okay in the great by and by. We need assurance that there is one person who is waiting for us. A person who will be our great companion on the last journey we all have to make from this world to the next through the icy waters of death. And we've got to know that when we get into those waters and we swim through them, they don't have to terrify us because there is an answer. In short, we need Jesus Christ who claims to be the resurrection and the life. Now, did you notice that Jesus actually says two things, two claims? He claims he's the resurrection, and he claims he is the life. And then he continues, and this is, he explains what he means. Whoever believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Now, friends, what we've got to do is we've got to link all those words together. And when we do, it's incredible to see the full picture emerging. I don't know if you've ever done this uh, as, an, as, a, as a kid or as an adult. You know, you get the dot-to-dot the -dot pictures. And you get all the little dots all around the page, and you get all the little numbers. And what have you got to do? You've got to get your pen. And you've got to draw and draw. And then before your eyes, what happens? You don't just have a few squiggles. Suddenly, as you connect the dots, you think, wow, look at that. But to see the full picture, you've got to connect the dots. Well, that's what we've got to do here. We connect all the dots together, and we will finally see the wonderful picture of Jesus. So the first dot we connect 
is that Jesus says he's the resurrection. Which is Jesus' way of saying that he has the power to bring the physical life back to those who have physically died. That's what he means, the resurrection. I'm going to bring physical life back to you. That is, those who believe in Jesus will physically live at one point, even though they will physically die. That is the ultimate hope for a Christian. Uh, please know this. The ultimate hope for a Christian is not somehow to escape from our bodies, but to escape from sin and to escape from suffering, but to live in a physical body that is perfect. And you think, what kind of body is like that? Do you know, we have a model. We've got a prototype. He's called Jesus. The resurrection of the dead of Jesus Christ becomes the pattern for us. Uh, one day, if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, even though you will physically die, you will be physically raised to life in a body that is incorruptible. Praise God for that. In the meantime, Jesus says not simply that he is the resurrection. He says he's the life. He promises life. And he means by that spiritual relationship, life with God, that begins now. That's what he says. Anyone who has faith in him will experience life. Whoever lives by believing in me, says Jesus, will never die. You think, how do you get your head around all this? I thought you said, well, you're not going to die, but what if you die? Do you see the two things working? There is a life that will never stop when you believe in Jesus Christ. You have spiritual relationship, life with God. That is what it means to truly live, and that life will never stop. It will go through the grave. And then one day, ultimately, that will be joined by a physical resurrection life. Now, claims, aren't they? Are, it's one thing to make them. It is quite another thing to know if they are true. For example, today, and I know you've got an interesting question in your activity sheets if you were one of the children at this point. I could claim to be the best dancer in this barn. I've made it, okay? That's my claim. I'm the best dancer in the barn. Now, thankfully, because of social distancing, you can't come near me. You can't question that. You just got to sit back behind your masks and accept it, yeah? Or you could say, through the muffled mask, prove it. And I would have to demonstrate. And it would only, t I, I assure you this, it would only take seconds for you to realize that I am not the best dancer in the barn. Even if there was nobody in the barn, I would not be the best dancer in the barn. It's one thing, isn't it, to claim something, but what's the evidence to back it up? Now, what about Jesus? He's just made two outstanding claims that we want to be true. We want it to be true that he's the life. We want it to be true that there is resurrection life, but how do we know they're credible? Do we just have to believe it? What is Christian faith? Is it just a leap in the dark? No, no, because what does Jesus then do in the next few verses of John chapter 11? He shows us that his claims are believable. Now, that's what he does at the graveside of Lazarus. Listen to verse uh, 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, he comes to the tomb. It's a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And what does he say? Take away the stone. Now, you've got to be pretty sure of your guns to do that. Try that the next time you're at a funeral. Just open up the coffin, please. <laughs> you've got to be sure of what you're about to do next. Jesus then prays, and then verse 41, they take away the stone. Jesus looks up. He thanks his father, and then he has a conversation with Lazarus, verse 43, the dead man. And he simply says, Lazarus, come out. And what happens? The dead man comes out. He's all wrapped in the linen. And Jesus says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus has released him from the tomb of death. Why has he done this? Because here is the miracle to back up the claim of Jesus. How do we know that Jesus is the resurrection? How do we know that Jesus has the power to raise you and me physically from the dead? How do we know he's got the power to give us spiritual life now? Look at Lazarus. He is a walking, literally a walking example of the power of Jesus Christ over human death. Now, what does all this mean? Let me finish by giving you two implications for this. First, Christians believe in life after death and life before death. Both. And we want both. We want to really live now, but we want to live forever. Friends, without life after death, everything we do is like building a junk model out of toilet roll tubes. Have you ever done that? 
Maybe you did that as a kid. You get all the junk. You know, our kids are forever doing it. I'm trying to get things to the recycling, and they're taking things out of the recycling. Toilet roll tube, everything I want to recycle for my own well-being just goes to the dining room, and it gets built into something else, and they spend hours and hours and hours of it. Okay, and eventually what has to happen, don't tell my kids, it has to go in the bin. Because how foolish it would be for them to spend their entire lives building stuff out of toilet roll, and we think, ah, oh, we wouldn't do that, would we? Well, our toilet roll tubes are much more shiny, and the gadgets that we build, and the things that we invest in. But let me say this to you, without life after death, whatever you are building in your life is like building toilet roll tubes. We don't want that to be the case, do we? We want life after death. And that's the great news about the gospel. There is. And therefore, we can build things that actually matter. Life now and life to come through faith in Jesus. And second... Christians have a reason to believe what we believe. This is not just wishful thinking. Jesus Christ has acted in the past, and this gives us confidence in the future. So here's what I want to say. If you're a Christian listening to this, don't fear the death clock. The death clock is ticking, and we don't know how long it's got left. The truth is, of course, God does. And that's okay. God knows exactly how long is left on our clock. But when it finally rings for us, please know that our spiritual life in Christ that we enjoy now will continue beyond the grave, and one day when Jesus Christ returns, you will be raised physically from the grave. So be encouraged, friends. It's not wishful thinking. Jesus has done it all. Let's pray. So, Father, we pray that we would trust your words in this book. And we pray that our hearts will be lifted today because we know that life in Christ is worth everything. Amen.